Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Rachel Yakano. On this week's program, we tackle the current situation at the border and how this may affect President Biden's larger legislative agenda on immigration. We'll conclude with a segment of the gavel to discuss how the courts continue to influence the direction of immigration policy under the new administration. More of that to come, so stick around. With us this week is podcast regular Teresa Cardinal Brown, Director of Immigration and Cross Border Policy here at BPC. She is joined by Laura Hall, Managing Director of BPC Action, and Sadiqshin Nepal, the Immigration Fellow with the Immigration Project. Welcome, everyone. So let's start with the border. Over the last couple of weeks, the arrival of thousands of unaccompanied minors at the southwest border has strained resources and facilities, and seemingly the plans of the Biden administration to focus on legislative immigration reform. So, Teresa, there has been a lot of ink spilled over the last two weeks about the current situation at the border and whether or not it represents a crisis. Can you explain to us what exactly is happening and provide some context as to how it compares to recent crises we've read about over the last decade? Sure. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, it is a complicated situation, and I think uh, we have to understand how different uh, things that have happened over the bo- at the border of the last several years have been framed and why this is uh, serious, but not necessarily a crisis. So um, CBP has reported in February um, a very high number of people it has encountered at the southwest border. Uh, Now, people encountered uh, doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. These are people that both have been uh, apprehended by the Border Patrol trying to sneak in, uh, people who have turned themselves into the Border Patrol trying to seek asylum, and uh, folks like unaccompanied children who have been allowed to come into the United States to process their immigration case in immigration court. The vast majority of the folks that CBP is encountering are single adults, mostly men, and mostly coming from Mexico. Uh, And so they are mostly returned back to Mexico within a very short period of time, sometimes a matter of hours. They're not being admitted into the United States. That is the majority of encounters at the border right now, probably around 60 to 70 percent. Then there are families coming to the border. Most of them are also being returned back back to Mexico or back to the countries they came from. Uh, There are a small number of families that are being let into the country to pursue their immigration claims, uh, mainly families with very small children. And lastly is the group of unaccompanied minors. These are mostly teenagers. Um, They are mostly from Central America. And the Biden administration has decided that it will not return minors summarily to Mexico or to their home countries, but allow them to come in and process their claims. And it is this last group that represents about uh, 9,000 encounters in the last month um, that is straining the systems and facilities available to house them and to care for them until they can be placed with families in the United States. So the crisis, to the extent there is a crisis, is one of capacity for these unaccompanied minors. It's not necessarily a crisis of numbers because these numbers are lower than we've seen in the past. They're lower than the highs from 2019. They're about in line with what we saw back in 2014. But the overall capacity uh, of CBP and of Health and Human Services to hold these children and facilitate their um reuniting with family in the United States has been limited by coronavirus restrictions. So the capacity of the system is smaller, the numbers have increased, and that's what is causing, if you will, a backup uh, where children are being held much longer in CBP border facilities. Um, I should also mention that even the total number of encounters is still smaller than the peaks that we saw back in the early 2000s. Uh, The last decade has seen actually relatively low numbers in total of arrivals to the U.S.-Mexico border compared to historic highs. But um, we've kind of gotten used to that. So any increase that we see uh, is being paid attention to a lot by the press, a lot by political actors. uh, And so this term crisis gets thrown around a lot. It is serious in that children are being held in facilities that are good for them. It is serious in that the numbers are coming in faster than 
uh, the government could add capacity. And it is serious in that um, they're still going into a very backlogged system for claiming uh, asylum in the immigration courts. Uh, and so all of these are things that the Biden administration is going to have to address uh, pretty quickly uh, going forward. You wrote an Outlook piece in The Washington Post last week talking about some solutions that the Biden administration should take to address the current situation. Can you talk a little bit about what you recommended and whether or not the Biden administration has done any of those things? Sure. So I think it's important for us to understand because I think a lot of people and a lot of politicians talk about uh, the deterrence effects. Like, what can we do to deter people from coming? And even the Biden administration has tried to send very strong signals to migrants not to come. But the reality is that whatever messages the United States government is sending uh, is pretty ineffective when the situation that people are leaving is so desperate and dire. And um, so we have to understand the limits of uh, our messaging, first of all, but also this idea that we can deter migrants. I think what we have seen, particularly with waves of migration that have happened over the last decade, is that our efforts at deterring people from coming uh, seem to have only temporary effect. Usually what it does is bottleneck up a, a, a a perspective pool of migration, either in Mexico or in Central America, that's simply just biding their time waiting to come in later. And given the situation that they're leaving, our efforts at deterrence would have to continually get worse than the situations they're leaving from. That was one of the big criticisms about the Trump policies that did result in a, in a temporary reduction of migration at the border, uh, but did so using very harsh policies that were subject to a lot of criticism, such as family separation or detaining families or sending families to live in squalid tent camps in Mexico for years, awaiting their turn to come in. And that's where they've been criticized. Um, so what I have said is that we need to rethink our entire situation of managing the arrival of people at the border. That means we can no longer uh, depend on this idea that the majority of people encountered at the border will be Mexican and can be sent back to Mexico. Um, we're going to have a persistent increase we have for eight years now in families and children, more vulnerable populations from further away, from Central America, South America, other continents. And we need to reconfigure our border infrastructure and processes to address that change. That means maybe we don't invest so much in cells that are jail-like for adults, uh, but we create family reception centers where they can be uh, taken at from the border, uh, provided with humanitarian care and emergency needs uh, that is suitable for families and children, um, while their cases are being processed to decide whether or not they can stay or go, but can do so in a humane condition. Um, we need to address our asylum system and provide more capacity, uh, surge resources, not not, but to the border, uh, whether that's asylum adjudicators, uh, FEMA, which we have called for and which the President Biden has sent to the border to help uh, find temporary facilities and provide humanitarian assistance and logistics capability, which they are excellent at. Um, so in the short term, I think those are the things that you need to do when you see an increase. But then you need to think about what long-term investments need to be made. How can we work better with Mexico and the countries in the region and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees? If there are really are people needing protection, how can we provide that protection uh, not without them having to come to the border? Can we uh, expand our refugee resettlement programs in the region? Can we get other countries willing to provide sh safe havens for people? And then in the long term, we have to invest in the countries they're sending from. At the end of the day, if the situation in those countries remains as dire as it is, people will continue to want to leave. And so if we want to ultimately uh, reduce those incentives, uh, we have to help those countries do better for their own population. So people feel hope and can stay where they are. Uh, and that's really the, the sort of short, medium, and long-term things we need to be looking at. So what about the border policies from the Trump administration? For example, Biden continues to turn away most families and adults under the CDC Title 42 order that Trump put in place. What do you think will happen there? Well, I think what the Biden administration has seen is that once it lifted the rule about expelling unaccompanied minors under Title 42, they saw an increase. And they didn't pre-prepare, or maybe they weren't able to prepare for that increase before they came. And so I think one of the things that they are strongly 
trying to figure out is how can they put in place systems to address what would likely be an increase in families and other arrivals if they lifted the Title 42 CDC order and have that capacity in place before they do so, so that they don't, if you will, get behind um, and uh, run into the same issue they're having with unaccompanied minors. Um, they have not indicated that they are likely to take down the Title 42 uh, order anytime soon. But the reality is, is that order is based on the persistence of COVID uh, in the United States and in other countries. And as we increase vaccinations in the U.S. and around the world, um, the, the rationale for that order will diminish. Uh, the order is also under litigation. Uh, there are many uh, immigration organizations that argue that, that, that the way that order was put in place under the Trump administration was not proper. It, uh, it cut off avenues for asylum that are permitted and uh, required under other provisions of law. So saying that that order trumped, uh, if you will, the other provisions of law was illegal. If those cases come to court and the courts order them to stop, um, that may force the administration's hand. But for right now, it is a tool that they are using to try to manage the numbers as they uh, try to expand other systems and capacity. And now a look at the legislative outlook. So all of this attention at the border seems to be overshadowing Biden's legislative agenda on immigration. But the House is actually voting on some immigration bills. So Laura, I'll turn to you. What bills is the House taking up and why are they moving now? Yes, the House is voting on two pieces of legislation, the Dream and Promise Act, which is a bill that provides permanency to the dreamer population, that group of young children who were brought to the United States um, when they were quite young and have lived here for most of their lives, as well as the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which is um, a bill to kind of ad address agriculture workers and things in the United States. So they're moving through the House um this week, we expect that they will pass later on today, hopefully in a bipartisan manner. I, I think that they will. Um, as to why they're they're moving now, uh, I think this has always been a priority for the Democrats. First, the dreamer population is one of the top priorities for both kind of the Democratic caucus as well as President Biden. So I think this is fulfilling on some of his campaign promises to tackle this issue early in his administration. Uh, the Farm Workforce Modernization Act is a bipartisan piece of legislation. It was from last Congress. It got reintroduced this Congress. It's got pretty good bipartisan support. So I think that the idea of, of moving both of these things at the same time, hopefully to make a, a strong showing that immigration is something that, while it might seem a little bit overwhelming and scary to tackle in a bipartisan manner, there is opportunity and there is kind of optimism around this. I think the goal is probably to, to tackle these two bills and then maybe move forward to other pieces of legislation. President Biden touted his comprehensive bill on his first day in office, and the bill was introduced in Congress some weeks later, the U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021. Laura, what's the status of this bill? Why are other bills moving before this larger piece of legislation? Great question. I tend to think of bills that essentially... Um, kind of originate from uh, the White House or a president to be a little bit of a statement of administration priorities. Um, we know that given the slim majorities in both the House and Senate, that passing anything large like this, like a big comprehensive immigration bill, is something that would require buy-in from both parties and bipartisan support. So I don't think the bill is laid out by the president would be able to make it through either chamber um, as written. So I tend to think of it as like a starting point. This is where President Biden sees his priorities. These are some of his goals. This is where the administration would like things to be, but it's probably not going to be the end point just because I don't think as written, they can get through in a bipartisan way. Um, in terms of why the smaller bills, I think that it kind of goes along those lines. It comes down to strategy and tactics a little bit. Could you move a very large bill with a lot of things in it? Uh, probably not, given the current composition of um, the House and Senate. But are there pieces within that larger bill that we can kind of pick off to move forward, such as permanency for the dreamers, such as some tweaks to the agricultural workforce? I think they've taken that that gamble and decided that that's the best path forward, piecemeal versus like a big comprehensive bill. Um, I'm sure they're hoping that this leads to bigger and better things down the line, but you have to take that first step. And I'm excited they're doing that this week. So what are the prospects for these bills in the Senate? What will be more difficult and what might be easier to pass? 
Yeah, just in terms of tactics and techniques. So almost anything right now, given just the way the House is set up in terms of voting and and how legislatively you need to advance things in the House, the Democrats can kind of muscle through most things they need to through the House of Representatives. Um, It just needs to kind of pass by a simple majority. The Democrats have the votes to do that. Um, And the Senate is a little bit of a different beast, though, because without utilizing some procedural techniques like reconciliation or, you know, chatter about eliminating the filibuster, most legislative vehicles have to get to 60 votes to move forward in the Senate, which is a very clear mandate for bipartisanship. They'd have to have a significant amount of Republican support to move anything through in the Senate. Um, I think that's there with the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act is overwhelmingly popular amongst kind of the American people. You know, I'm hearing lots of chatter amongst senators, Republican senators and Democrat senators alike, that this is something that they're hoping to um move forward this session. It's been on the plate for a long time. I think it's encouraging. And I think hopefully this is the time it finally gets done. So I think it's going to be harder in the Senate, definitely, because it's going to have to be a true bipartisan effort. Um, There's certainly senators on both sides of the aisle that that want to see this done. So Sadiq Shah, I want to bring you in here. These bills broadly address many undocumented immigrants, and the Farm Workforce Modernization Bill addresses agricultural workers. But you've written about the lack of much of a conversation around high-skilled immigration. What is in the U.S. Citizenship Act, and what do you think is missing in this regard? Yeah, so there is a lot to be hopeful for in the U.S. Citizenship Act. I mean, it does um, it does eliminate the seven percent per country cap that a lot of people have rallied around. That that including accepting spouses and children from the from the annual um, EB based uh, visa caps, as well as allowing anybody to apply for a green card that have been waiting for more than ten years. These things are surely um, going to be able to increase the number of people who are going to. Be be um, immigrating to the U.S., like future flows that we talk about. Um, On top of that, the Biden administration is also asking multiple agencies to um, uh, to analyze, you know, skill mismatch and education mismatch for refugees and immigrants so that they can get better jobs. A lot of good things in the bill. The one thing that I would say is missing on the high skilled immigration side is that while majority of the focus is on increasing visa numbers, for example, on the EB3 other workers category, it increases from 10,000 to 40,000, bringing the total visa increases for employment-based visas from 140,000 to 170,000. These increases, while they happen on the permanent green card immigration um, side, there's not much uh, reform on the temporary high-skilled visa side, such as the H-1B, except for allowing uh, dependent children of H-1B workers uh, and preventing them from aging out. While not focusing on the H-1B reform, what it may do is it may just help reform like half end of the puzzle. Um, In, uh, for example, in the fiscal year 2018, 79% of people who adjust the status from uh, a temporary employment adjust the status to permanent employment-based green card, they were already in the country. Uh, These adjustments of uh, statuses for the last 10 years, it's been 89%. So, most people are already here on some other type of temporary visas. So if you are not reforming high-skilled temporary visas and only focusing on the permanent one, that would just, you know, take care of half end of the puzzle. So I think in order to um, reform the entire pipeline, um, equal amount of focus should also be paid uh, paid to reforming the H-1B visas for high-skilled workers. Um, What's also very interesting to uh, look at in the the Citizenship Act is that there is not much uh, or anything really for entrepreneurs who might want to move to the United States to start a business uh, that could be very helpful for our COVID economic recovery. What does exist is a pilot program that adds uh, 10,000 visas for local and regional economic improvement, but that visa requires labor certificate. So it's not uh, entirely clear how entrepreneurs might be able to use that um, uh, to which makes it clear that entrepreneurs would not be able to use that because getting a labor certification to start and own business, it's um, it's a really difficult process. So that wouldn't be very helpful for business owners and business starters, which we may need for our uh, U.S. economic recovery going forward. I've also written about lesser skilled visas, and there isn't a lot in the act on that front either. Sadiqsha, why do you think these issues are important to address? 
Um, yeah, like uh, Teresa mentioned earlier about the Central American migration, uh, one important fact is also about, you know, we keep talking about undocumented workers coming in, but there is no there is no pathway for them to come in legally, except for perhaps the asylum system. So if we want them to come to the United States with different channels, and uh, many of them are of working age, uh, for some statistics, 54% of um, El Salvadorians and 63% of Guatemalans, 56% uh, of Hondurans, uh, by accounts of the World Bank, are of working age. They want economic opportunity in the United States, uh, providing them you know, for lesser skilled, uh, temporary visas to enter the United States to do some sort of seasonal work here may be that channel for them to come to the United States if they don't fit into the asylum category. Um, it would also, uh, the Center for Global Development did a statistics that uh, uh, H-2 visas are going to Mexican workers um, at a 32, per, 32 times per capita higher rates than Hondurans. And so significantly, Hondurans' uh, apprehension at the border is 20, 20 times higher than Mexican apprehensions per capita. So you can see that, you know, a uh, majority of the people who enter the United States on H-2 visas are from Mexico. For example, for H-2A visas, um, in, I think, 2018, 94% of those visas went to Mexican nationals. Same thing with H-2B. Uh, almost 74% went to nationals from Mexico. Following Jamaica, they only got 10% of the visas. So um, allowing people to come here with temporary visas might have an effect on our unauthorized population as well. Um, and it would just be a channel of, of, of access uh, to enter the United States if they were not to meet, meet the asylum system. Finally, it's time for another installment of The Gavel. <laughs> Teresa, we did a lot of gavel segments during the Trump administration but it seems like the courts continue to be influential in national immigration policy. So first, let's talk about Biden's 100-day deportation moratorium. This was one of his day one promises, but as soon as the ink was dry on that DHS memo implementing it, it was subsequently taken to court. Give us a status update about what's happening in this case. So um, the state of Texas was the first uh, state, uh, the attorney general of Texas, to sue the Biden administration over the 100-day moratorium. And a judge at a federal district court in Texas uh, did put a temporary stay on that portion of the memorandum from DHS realigning immigration enforcement priorities. Since that time, other states' attorneys general have joined the litigation fight. So um, the Florida attorney general filed a lot lawsuit against ICE's enforcement priorities. Uh, the Montana and Arizona Air attorneys general also sued to stop the 100-day moratorium. Uh, these lawsuits include the also the rest of that memorandum on prioritization of immigration enforcement in the country. Uh, the memorandum uh, sort of took immigration enforcement back to Obama days that um, made uh, priorities of serious criminality, uh, recent border crossers or national security threats, but deprioritized most other immigrants in the United States so that ICE would have to actually seek permission if it was going to apprehend or arrest other undocumented immigrants that don't meet those priorities. Um, these states' attorneys general argue that these changes in priorities um, impact them uh, adversely. Um, and in particular, uh, before they left office, the Trump DHS officials had signed some memorandums with different states uh, that they would not change immigration enforcement priorities without consulting with the states. Now, DHS has since said that those agreements are null and void, that they were improperly uh, uh put in place in the first place. But what we're seeing is that uh, Republican state's attorney, state attorneys general are, are taking up the litigation uh, gavel and uh, suing over Biden policies, much the same way Democratic state attorneys general sued President Trump over many of his policies. Um, you know, where these court cases will go is hard to say. President Trump did succeed in um, getting a lot of conservative judges appointed to the federal bench across the country. And of course, now we have a conservative majority on the Supreme Court, should any of these cases get there. But in the meantime, what it's showing is that President Biden is likely to face uh, litigation over some of his more far-reaching uh, immigration policies, just as President Trump did. 
We've talked a lot about that the Biden administration has inherited many unresolved court cases from the Trump administration. And this week, the administration weighed in on some of them. Teresa, one of these was about the public charge rule and the Supreme Court. What happened there? Sure. So the Supreme Court was scheduled to take up oral arguments on litigation against the Trump administration public charge rule. Uh, there have been several different cases underlying this, um, the most recent of which was a uh, federal district court that ru ruled that the public charge rule was null and void. Uh, there was a stay of that ruling um, that the Supreme Court was supposed to hear. Um, the Biden administration actually went to the Supreme Court along with the plaintiffs in the case and said, look, we intend to remove this rule. Uh, we don't want to defend it any longer. And please just take this case off of your docket. And the Supreme Court agreed. So by doing that, that underlying vacator, as they call it, vacator of the public charge rule went into effect. And so the public charge rule it has been ruled null and void. Since then, the Department of Homeland Security has issued a notice in the Federal Register that that rule is no longer valid and um, that uh, adjudicators should go back to the policies that were in place before public charge went into effect. So here's a case in which the Biden administration, by declining to defend a Trump era policy, has in effect remove that policy rather than having to go through a subsequent notice and comment period. Now, there are a lot of other court cases that are still pending that the Biden administration has not yet weighed in on, and some that it has weighed in on the same way the Trump administration did. For example, uh, there's an asylum rule that requires filing of asylum applications within a deadline that the Trump administration uh you know, decided it was going to appeal an adverse court ruling against that Trump policy. So it's unclear what the strategy is there or where they want to go with it. There may be reasons other than the policy itself that it wants to defend the ability of the administration to take certain actions. Every court case is slightly different. So it's unclear what the strategy is there. But it's something to pay attention to, I think, as uh, we see how the Biden administration treats these outstanding court cases. That's it for today's show. Before we go, a quick reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform, and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find more information on all the issues we discuss here on the show today at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. You can follow us on Twitter at BPC underscore bipartisan. I'm Rachel Yakuno. This Week in Immigration was created by Teresa Cardinal Brown. The executive producer of This Week in Immigration is Teresa Cardinal Brown. This week's episode was written by Teresa Cardinal Brown and myself. Yafet Tawahada and Ethan Plotkin produce and edit our show. See you next time on This Week in Immigration. Mm -hmm.